1620, the Pilgrims landed on Plymouth Rock and brought with them the idea that a congregation of believers ought to be able to rule themselves. That was the beginning of the Congregational Way. For 300 years, Congregationalists have held to the ideal of local congregations seeking the guidance of God themselves without the dictates and oversight of magistrates or bishops. Congregationalists are a covenant people, having no defined doctrinal statement other than the Bible itself. We believe that the Word of God is living and active and constantly ready to meet the needs of people every day. We have resisted the temptation to boil down the whole counsel of God into a few statements of dogma. The Christian name comes as a relic of this church's organization in 1831 as part of a post-revolutionary war religious movement away from a church polity with inherently British roots. Each member of a congregational Christian church is a minister along with all the other members. It is our desire to reach out to one another and to the world in the name of Christ with love and acceptance and support. The first Christian community was centered in Jerusalem and its leaders included Peter and James and John, the original disciples of Jesus. In the year 385 AD in Rome, Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire. The Holy See was established in Rome. Although there were divisions before, 1517 saw the Reverend Martin Luther post his 95 theses on the door of his church in Wittenberg, Germany, objecting to the doctrines and rituals and some ecclesiastical structure of the Roman Catholic Church. Very soon after that, in England, which is where American Protestantism has its roots, the English Church broke away from the authority of the Roman Catholic Church after the Pope excommunicated Henry VIII over his divorce from the Baron Catherine of Aragon in order to marry her serving girl Anne Boleyn. This created the Anglican Church as the predominant state church. Established by the Pilgrims of Plymouth in 1620 and later in the Puritan migration to New England, congregational churches held Puritan or separatist theological and political perspectives, maintaining a broadly orthodox faith while cultivating a passion for freedom and equality and justice. Around 1800, following American independence, some in New England were convinced that the American Revolution demanded a thorough break with British modes of operation. Some churches gathered calling themselves only Christian, forsaking the word congregational. They demanded radical reform. They claimed no creed they professed strict reliance on the Bible. These new churches rejected the doctrine of election, also known as Calvinism, and were vehemently opposed to any centralized church government. By the 1850s, Christians and Congregationalists alike began to share similar experiences of the social movements, such as the temperance movement and the Sunday school movement, the abolition of slavery and the heyday of Bible societies. As modes of transportation improved, these churches engaged more in missionary activity. In the course of this, they began to overlook their differences. So that in 1931, an agreement forged in Seattle, Washington, merged the Christian churches with the Congregational churches to form the Congregational Christian Church. Preferring to preserve their traditional autonomy, some churches joined together in a national association of Congregational Christian Churches in 1957 rather than join a new merger of other churches with a centralized government. And there we are. We have no doctrine other than the whole Bible itself. We emphasize traditional evangelical themes such as regeneration, revivalism, acceptance of personal salvation, and the performance of good works of charity.
First, you may ask, why should you become a member of the covenant? The answer has a lot to do with mutual accountability. In God's covenant with the people of Israel, he stated, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. That's from the second book of Chronicles, chapter 7, verse 14. You can see that the people had some transforming to do, and God had some convincing to do, but the relationship was a public declaration, which meant that all members of the covenant could rely upon their mutual accountability for support in receiving the blessings of the covenant. In a marriage covenant, the same public acknowledgement of mutual fulfillment provides strength to the couple's intentions to have, to hold, to love, and to cherish each other. Conversely, a continuing worshiper who has not ever expressed publicly a desire to join in this covenant of faith has made no public commitment to the mutual accountability with others in their desire to be as Christ to one another. In our church, the names of new members are announced from the pulpit and then a week later, they stand and recite the Litany of the Covenant, followed by the right hand of fellowship. It's that easy. Our church observes two sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Infant baptism is available to any who are intent on raising their child in a covenant of faith. It's a gateway sacrament, and membership in the church is not required for baptism. Adults may be baptized at any time, either by sprinkling or by full immersion. Rebaptism is not generally practiced, but members are given the opportunity to be rededicated to their baptismal vows. The communion table is open to worshipers of all ages who love Jesus Christ and seek forgiveness for their sins. On the first Sunday of the month, we sit and are served bread and grape juice by the deacons. We partake simultaneously. We practice at least four other traditional rites, funerals or memorial services, marriages, confirmation, and anointing of the sick. If you grew up Roman Catholic, as have many in southeastern Massachusetts, the faith you practiced as a child differs from our beliefs on three important theological points. First is the authority of Scripture. We look to the Word of God as His authority in our lives, and not to traditions or to legends or to myths or to any individuals here on earth. Secondly, we believe in salvation by grace. We are saved only by the grace of God and by the sacrifice of His Son Jesus and not by any of our own good works by which we endeavor to earn salvation. And lastly, we believe in the priesthood of all believers. All people have direct access to the Father by virtue of the Holy Spirit. We are all recipients of His gifts by the same Spirit, and these gifts are to be used for His ministry. Faith, freedom, and fellowship is a long-standing phrase of the Congregational Way, which describes our notion that, as a non-creedal, non-doctrinal church, each member is responsible for his or her own understanding of Scripture, his or her own responsibility to the Word, and the grace of being in fellowship with others who might have received wisdom differently than himself or herself. How much should our religion cost us? While we may not expect to get for nothing faith's assurance and comfort and encouragement, in this age of consumer sophistication, every shrewd shopper strives for the right price. So. How much should we be willing to pay for the spiritual resources which help us find meaning and fulfillment in our lives? Go back to the Old Testament.
King David's religious advisor had explained that the only way to abate a plague that was happening in King David's time was for the king to make a sacrificial offering to God. Well, a farmer offered his threshing floor and the oxen and the wood for the fuel. King David was touched, but said to him, I'll buy these things from you. I will not offer burnt offerings to my God that have cost me nothing. And so our participation in the covenant should not be without financial commitment. Paul pointed out that the church has an essential economic dimension and that money is a significant part of mission. Scripture is clear. Every Christian has an obligation to provide financial support according to his or her means for the support of the church and its mission. The financial cost of our religion is as generous as our circumstances permit and as honorable as our conscience directs. It's an essential part of our being Christian. I will not offer to the Lord my God burnt offerings that have cost me nothing. The congregational way dictates that all decisions of the church are made not by individuals or by their individual influence, but by the will of God. God's will is expressed when the whole congregation gathers together and prays and listens and then shares the prompting of the Holy Spirit. The church's bylaws spell out this important concept, which is unique to congregationalism, along with the many functions of the church polity and governance. The primary function of any set of bylaws is to set parameters for the duties, the responsibilities, and limitations of our being called into community together. The bylaws of the East Freetown Congregational Christian Church specify our name, our purpose for organizing, which is to build up the kingdom of God, our polity, which is to say that we are independent of any other corporation or denomination, that we are identified by a Trinitarian belief. That means that we believe in the divinity of God and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. And that we are gathered by a covenant of faith which lays out certain personal obligations to the rest of the congregation. In addition, the bylaws outline the different types and means of membership and the responsibilities of boards and officers. The minister is to be responsible for the spiritual welfare and education of the church. Other leaders include the moderator, the clerk, the treasurer, the communion steward, the historian, and the superintendent of Sunday school, and some others. There are three boards that are charged with the sundry responsibilities of the covenant. The deacons assist in the worship services and in administering the sacraments. The trustees have responsibility for the maintenance of all church properties and permanent invested funds. The Board of Christian Education oversees any and all Christian education programs of the church. Once every other month, representatives of each board along with some at-large members meet together as an executive committee for the sharing of important information and to seek the counsel of the Spirit on emergent matters. Still other committees are formed for various tasks, including missions, sunshine, flowers, social life, visiting, nominations, music, finance, and fundraising. Our covenant was adopted in 1917 and really shows the roots of our Christian church connection. It goes like this. Thankful for God's everlasting mercy and for his great gift of salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord, we covenant and agree together to see, to know, and to do his holy will and to promote the triumph of our Savior's kingdom over the world. Heartily believing that the scriptures were given by the inspiration of God and that they are profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for the instruction in righteousness, and also that Christian freedom requires that they be interpreted by individual judgment, 
we covenant together to accept the Bible as our supreme standard of faith and duty, and to recognize as Christians and worthy of our fellowship all who devoutly love the Lord Jesus Christ and sustain a life of Christian piety as taught by the Word of God. Anxiously desiring that all differences which separate Christ's people may be removed and that there may be one flock and one shepherd, we covenant together to lay aside all distinctive and party names and taking our title from the great head of the church to be known simply and only as Christians. Furthermore, realizing that the success of each church depends upon the consecration of its individual membership, we covenant together to attend the services of the church, to contribute according to our means to its support, to labor together to maintain its peace and harmony, and in every way promote its temporal and spiritual welfare, looking for our reward to the peace of God which surpasses all understanding and to the crown of rejoicing laid up for all who love Christ's appearing. The scriptures teach us that the church is the household of God, the body of which Christ is the head. Among its privileges are incitements to Christian character from hearing God's word, sharing in Christ's commands, and the enjoyment of the blessings of the gospel. To seek admission into this fellowship, new members enter into solemn covenant with this church and with God under one of three different designations. First, there is a letter of transfer for those who have been active in another Christian church and feel led to transfer membership to this body of faith. This is done by asking your former church to issue a letter to this church acknowledging that you are a member in good standing in your previous church and asking us to assume your pastoral and spiritual care. Secondly, reaffirmation of faith is for those who have previously professed faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and joined a Christian church, but have become inactive in church involvement before moving on to this church. Thirdly, affirmation of faith is for those who have never publicly made a profession of their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and are doing so now, essentially joining a church's fully grown Christian for the first time. All new members participate in a litany of the covenant and receive the right hand of fellowship from our deacons and pastor, indicating that they are no longer strangers and sojourners, but are now fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. 